Hi everyone, my name is Ellie Baumstein from the Wallace Center at Winrock International. Welcome to this National Good Food Network webinar entitled Value Chain Coordination, Getting Started. Uh, the Wallace Center is a business unit of Winrock International and is the host of the National Good Food Network webinars. Wallace has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 30 years. We develop partnerships, pilot new ideas, and advance solutions to strengthen communities through resilient farming and food systems. Uh, the National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center that accelerates progress towards the Wallace Center's vision. The NGFN is a connector. We connect peer-to-peer, peer-to-expert, and practitioners to best practices and lessons learned. We do all of this at a national scale so that innovations spread rapidly throughout the good food world. Uh, you can learn more about the great work of the Wallace Center at wallacecenter.org and all about the National Good Food Network at ngfn.org. We encourage you to dig into all of the resources on those sites, including our large collection of archived webinars. So this webinar today is the first of a four-part series on the practice of value chain coordination. Our presenters will give you a lot more information on what value chain coordination means and how you can add it to your local food strategy toolkit. We at Wallace have spent nearly 10 years thinking and learning about food hubs. Through this process, we started noticing a trend among successful hubs. The ones that do well tend to be supported by really strong networks. This led us to dig into what these networks, which we also call value chains, are, how they function, and how you can build them. We've spent more than two years doing this through a program called Foodlink, which is a partnership with the USDA. We've learned that value chain coordination is really a set of roles that value chain coordinators and other local food practitioners play in regional food systems. So this series is gonna do a deeper dive into a few of those roles. Today, we'll be learning about both the general concept of value chain coordination and how to get started and some tips for evaluation. Uh, now I'm going to introduce our first panelist, Jim Barham. Uh, Jim is an agricultural, agricultural economist for USDA's Rural Development Agency. Since 2007, Jim has worked at USDA on improving marketing opportunities for small and mid-sized producers through a combination of research, technical assistance, and financial support. Jim has presented, researched, and published a number of articles on regional food hubs, food value chains, local food distribution, and food service procurement. He is the USDA lead for Foodlink, a public-private partnership to support value chain coordination efforts, and also serves as a senior advisor to Rural Development's Innovation Center, which is a recent, recently established office developing innovative products, policies, and practices to empower rural community transformation. And with that, Jim, I'm gonna hand the mic over to you. Thank you very much, Ellie. Can you hear me? Just a ch quick check. Yep, you sound good. Great. Uh, welcome, and thanks to the Wallace Center for inviting me to be part of uh, this uh, series on value chain coordination. It's very exciting for them to be, uh, for all of us to kind of kick off the series and then, you know, watch it progress and get deeper and deeper and hopefully provide a lot of uh, value tools, uh, information support for all of you in the food system space that, in one way or another, I guarantee are doing value chain coordination activities. Uh, so, let me go to the first slide. Ellie mentioned Foodlink. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just as a little bit of background, um, Foodlink was an initiative uh, where we partnered with the Wallace Center and a number of uh, philanthropic organizations to um, really pilot and, and, and help fund and support value chain coordinators that were primarily helping rural producers uh, link into urban markets where there's demand for local food. So it's a three-year pilot. We're on the last year of that pilot right now. Um, and it has, um, I think, really exceeded our expectations in many ways. It, it started as a very small initiative, uh, some seed money from rural development, USDA rural development, um, and then with additional support from philanthropy, and then even more additional support from other federal partners both within USDA and outside, uh, we've been able to cobble together what has now become about a $5.5 million initiative over three years to not only finance value chain coordination work, but to really help elevate uh, what we think the value of this work is. 
to really shine a, a bright spot on this uh, in the important work of value chain coordination. Um, there's a lot that if you even just Google the Wallace Center and Food Link, uh, they have some really nice information uh, that provides information on Food Link, some of the resources that we've developed, uh, a lot more information on the community of practice, which we're not going to necessarily go into a lot of today, but I think through the the series of value chain coordination, you'll learn more about the value chain coordination community of practice, some of the results of that, some of the impacts it's having. So um, stay tuned on a lot of that information. I just wanted to kind of show briefly who our partners have been in FoodLink. So you have USDA, um, several different agencies there, Appalachian Regional Commission, which is kind of an economic regional development organization, obviously in the Appalachian region as well as Delta Regional Authority, and then our philanthropic partners who really went, we went into this initiative uh, trying to uh, create, kind of co-develop this idea of how we can support value chain coordination with philanthropy so that it just doesn't elevate in the policy arena, but it really brings our private investor partners into this space to co-invest with us, to begin and, and really continue the process. So in a lot of cases with the value chain coordinators we're working with, while our funding has stopped, um, a lot of our value chain coordinators continue to be funded by this and other philanthropic partners who are seeing the value of this work. So uh, main role for me today is really just talk about two concepts, what are value chains and what are the roles of value chain coordinators? You know, and, and that's what I'll hopefully go over and, and provide enough information for you to, uh, for all of us to be a little more dangerous in understanding what these concepts are. But um, to begin with, what is a food value chain? And, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you have seen this before, uh, but hopefully there's some people that, you know, the concept itself is fairly new to them. But um, with the bottom line is food value chains in some ways look a lot like a supply chain on the surface, right? They've got, they do all the activities you expect in a supply chain uh, happen in a value chain. Those activities being products are still produced, they're still aggregated, they're processed, they're distributed, they're marketed and sold into restaurants, schools, hospitals, grocery stores, the consumer buys that product, eats that product, and you kind of continue that complete cycle. That happens anyway. That is the supply chain, right? Whether it's a local supply chain, whether it's an international supply chain. But the difference here is when we're talking about food value chains, we're talking about businesses actually intentionally aligning with each other to structure their core operations to produce both those financial successes that we expect in a supply chain, and here's the key, but also to create social benefit, right? That is fundamentally different in many food supply chains, where many of the supply chains is one uh, supply chain actor competing over the other supply chain actor, and you kind of get this, um, you know, you get the zero-sum game, a uh, game approach, as opposed to here, we're trying to cure, uh, have a net benefit, net profit, for a net reward and equitable distribution of those rewards all along the entire value chain. And how do businesses actually get there to that? Well, they have to actually intentionally sit down, align themselves with each other, talk about where the risk and rewards are, and come up with two um, sets of values. And that's really what I'm referring to here in terms of this graphic. There are shared mission values. That supply chain comes together to develop a value chain because they believe in certain things or adhere to a certain set of values, those mission values. It might be that they're really coalescing around healthy food access. Right. It could be that a hospital chain is working with certain distributors and working with certain producers to be able to say, we want to serve in our cafeterias healthier food, not just to our employers, but also to our patients. Right. And then the whole value chain can be developed around that core mission value. Same thing could be on, on sustainable production practices or on farm viability, simply saying we want to develop this value chain so that more benefits accrue, that more money ends up in the pockets of producers. That is a, a basic value proposition for a lot of food hubs out there, is we see that there is a disconnect between where there is high market demand for local food, and we have a lot of these small to mid-sized producers who are trying to tap into that market, but yet if they go the traditional wholesale route, they don't really accrue many benefits, they don't have more, they don't get a greater return. So we're gonna develop this food hub which can hopefully provide a greater return to these producers and how you know hopefully have other benefits as well so that's that shared mission value so you come around that and then on the other side it's just important it's not just that 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 mission value but those operational values that you're going to commit to accountability and and having a long-term commitment that this isn't just going to be a one-off thing that you're going to commit to transparency and open ongoing communications 
So developing these value chains are and can be extremely difficult to do, but if you can get there to a place where you have a robust value chain, then you see that benefits do accrue to all the folks, all the value chain actors. Okay, so with that, how do we create value chains? Um, a few years ago, well, it really, it, it's funny, and there's a little background history, we were talking about food value chains 10 years ago. Um, a lot of that work came from just as a little bit of background, if you want to learn more about this, from the work that Rich Purog and Steve Stevenson had done called values-based food supply chain. And that's what we're talking about. We just shortened it to food value chains because it's really hard sometimes to say values-based food supply chains, you know, a lot. Uh, but that is what we're talking about. And some people coming from the international space talk about value chains very differently. So just to also want to make that differentiation. But we sat down 10 years ago and started to think about these value-based food supply chains. What are they? How do you create them? And ultimately, it did culminate, although it took much longer than any of us expected, into a, a, a publication with the Wallace Center uh, on food value chains, creating shared value to enhance marketing success. I, it's that publication, even though it's a few years old, I think it's still very relevant, particularly some of the findings that came out of it. And one of the key takeaways, as you see here on this slide, is that Developing a food value chain has, it's not really about the infrastructure. In fact, developing robust and resilient local regional food systems has less to do with the infrastructure, no matter what people tell you, and it has a lot more to do with building those relationships. And that one of the best investments you can make in developing local regional food systems is actually in that human capital, and that being what we call value chain coordinators. I also like to make the distinction between investments in hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. So when we talk about hard infrastructure, we are talking about investments. And yes, we need scale appropriate processing facilities. And yes, we need the warehousing. And yes, we need the trucks on the road. And we need these hard infrastructure pieces in any system, particularly scale appropriate to the system we're trying to develop and sustain. At the same time, none of that hard infrastructure is going to work all that well unless you have that soft infrastructure. You have those relationships in place that you have people that are intentionally connecting the dots within these value chains in order to make it work. So with that, what are these value chain coordinators, right? As we say, if you need to make this investment, if this is a key piece of building uh, robust, resilient, sustainable local regional food systems, you need these value chain coordinators. Who are they? Well, in one way, they're like a conductor. I'm going to go over the different roles we've kind of uh, surfaced over the years. Uh, I like this quote came from um, Society General. Uh, Zafar Khan, in the theory, decentralization is a good idea, but it's like an orchestra. The danger uh, comes when it's not monitored and it's not coordinated. And I think of local regional food systems, the intent is to decentralize in many ways our national centralized food system and create more local food systems. And you need a conductor in there because things are decentralized, but you want those connectivities. And much like an orchestra, without the conductor, it's just a lot of people playing music to their own tunes, maybe off key, but he can bring or she can bring kind of that fluidity and that harmony to the ultimately the entire piece. So I think that's a good metaphor or an analogy. Now I'm getting those things screwed up. But anyway, uh, let's look at the roles of value chain coordinator. Um, as we started to really dive deeper into value chain coordination and what the roles are, these six emerged. And I, I kind of put them in a, a tier one, tier two category, although we don't have it here and people can certainly argue with me on that. The tier one category, which I think are essential to any value chain coordinator, um, uh, both their effectiveness and their role, are these first two, market match matchmaker and convener and relationship builder. The market matchmaker in a lot of cases could be just uh, what can also be called a public interest broker, someone who is sitting there and can be doing even some short-term one-off engagement. Say Farmer Jane has got some really good uh, product that, that I think Chef Joe is gonna really like, let me connect them together. Let me just make the call, have set up a meeting for the, for the two of them to sit down and look at the products the farm chain has and see if this is something Chef Show wants to do, right? It could be as simple as, not, not that that's even simple to make that arrangement, but it could be kind of almost a one-off, good luck, Farmer Jane, good luck, Chef Joe, I hope this works out for you, right? Maybe do a little follow-up, make sure the relationship sticks. That could be the more one-off aspect of it. On the convener relationship building piece, it could be like, to say, the hospital example, you're developing a long-term, you want to create a long-term relationship along the entire value chain between, you know, the producers and the distributors and the processors and the food service uh, and, the, and the food service company that might be working with the hospital or the school 
And it may take a long time to kind of fit all those pieces together. And it might take you two years before the first sale comes in, right? So the, both of those things are happening, but it is that market matchmaking. It is that convening. It's developing these value chains for both the short-term and long-term gain. I call that kind of tier one piece of the role supply chain coordinator. That's kind of what they're doing, right? Connecting the dots, helping find markets for producers, helping buyers find those producers and so forth and so on. Now, along with that, when that's happening, particularly in the longer term engagement piece, there are other roles that a value chain coordinator is just going to have to do. It's going to be on the technical system side. They begin to realize, oh, we can really tap into this hospital system, but my farmers or the, the farmer uh, population they want to work with are, you know, very few are GAP certified, right? They don't have the, the, the right food safety requirements to be able to sell directly, to sell into that hospital system. So now I'm going to have to spend time either working directly with them because we have some experience doing GAP training or finding extension or finding a, a nonprofit or another organization that can help build the capacity of those farmers to ultimately uh, get into the hospital system. And, and I know, you know, Brenda can be, uh, from Communities Unlimited certainly has a lot of experience uh, with that, specifically examples of trying to get hot, hot, you know, product into the hospital with, uh, and getting to their farmers GAP certified. The policy thought leader piece is another thing that might come in. There might be just some local policies, you know, kind of a, with a lowercase p of, great, we'd love to set this system up, but there's zoning challenges, and now we need the municipality to step in to be able to help us in order to actually be able to site this warehouse here in order to do, you know, X, Y, or Z. And so be able to help do that. That certainly happens in the policy environment. We're talking about procurement, institutional procurement. Again, it might just mean spending time with the contractor to rewrite the contract so that there's better procurement policies in place. So that stuff pops up as well. Resource prospector, again, simply, you know, might mean that there, you know, there might be uh, financing that's needed up and down the value chain in order to really make it work efficiently and effectively. And then there's times where the value chain corner themselves realize, wow, we tried to work with existing distributors. We tried to work with this organization, this organization, but there clearly is a gap and there is a need for a food hub, right? And we are going to help incubate and, 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 and incubate both the, uh, the functions of that food hub and hopefully find an entrepreneur who can step in to actually run that food hub because that is a gap and there's no way to fill it with the existing resources. So even being the catalyst and innovator of a, of a new business within the value chain is something a value chain coordinator could be, be doing. So these six, there could be more. Um, it's, it's not an, uh, an exhaustive list, but these are things we, that tend to continue to pop up. Through our work with the value chain coordinators on the food link, um, the 13 that we've worked with, they have, um, I think it was, it was somewhat off the cuff and uh, being somewhat, you know, just funny, but they said a seventh one is just being a professional nag, which is just getting, just getting these people to talk with each other, reminding them about certain things, make sure they're, they're, they are doing what they're supposed to do. Uh, that might be an overarching uh, role that you find in all these professional nag. Okay, on the next slide, um, again, this is kind of a reference back to the food link, just to let you know the organizations we have been working with across the country on value chain coordination. There's a little uh, bulleted point below that uh, mentions the community of practice, which the Wallace Center has a lot of information on their site about. And we really use this community of practice as a opportunity to, for both the value chain corners to, to learn from each other, to have that peer to peer learning, to uh, be an effective way to provide target assistance or technical assistance to the value chain coordinators and, and to learn from them, right? A lot of best practices or promising practices, probably a better word, um, are emerging out of the work that we've been doing through this community of practice with these certain value chain coordinators. And one of the things that has emerge just in terms of typology, because I'm an economist and I like my typologies, um, is that, and this was not really intentional when we went through the process of selecting these, these organizations to work with, but it ended up kind of dividing up evenly between what we would call social enterprise VCCs, again, VCC being short for value chain coordinators, and relational VCCs. Uh, social enterprise means that that VCC has been, um, is part of an organization uh, or sorry, a social enterprise like a food hub or a retail store even. Um, and then, you know, and so that they, they are part and parcel of that social enterprise, but also trying to achieve outcomes that we're trying to see in the food system space of linking farmers. So, for example, uh, La Montanita has a value chain coordinator. They have also have four retail stores as a food co-op. Value chain coordinator is certainly responsible for bringing product from producers into the store, new products into the store. 
But when there's an opportunity for that producer to get their products into other stores or another market channel, they're going to seize that opportunity. And because the bottom line for them is ensuring farm viability, because if the farms don't make it out there, then their retail stores ain't got a prayer in terms of a place of market differentiation. Relational VCs don't have that same kind of um, opportunity to work directly with a social enterprise like that, to be embedded in a social enterprise. Uh, and they have both their challenges, but also it gives them a little more freedom, a little more flexibility to where they work and what they do. Uh, yet at the same time, when we as an organization like the USDA or Wall Center are looking to do evaluation, which uh, Rebecca is going to get into in a second, it's a little harder to kind of collect that type of information um, because uh, it requires just even that level of trust of, hey, you know, you're working with a distributor. You, could you give me some of your numbers in terms of, you know, how much money is moving through on this particular value chain? No, th this is all things that need to be worked out. But that's just one of the things that has emerged uh, from our work together. Okay, that's it. Um, I will say that, unfortunately, due to a conflict that just emerged, I have to get off the line in about 10 to 15 minutes. But if you have any questions um, for me, feel free to type them in the chat uh, box or in the questions, sorry, in the questions. I don't know which one, chat or questions. I think Ellie can clarify. Um, yeah, the questions box. Yeah, the questions box. And I'll, I'll be happy to, um, while I'm still here with you all, type in some answers. and. But you got my email here, so feel free to reach out to me directly if you'd like to talk about anything I've discussed today. And thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um, that was a great background, uh, and I think gave everybody a really solid grounding. Uh, next up, we're going to pass the mic off to Rebecca Dunning, who's going to provide some guidance on how to track and capture the impacts and metrics of your value chain work. Uh, Rebecca Dunning is a faculty member in the Department of Horticultural Sciences at North Carolina State University and an affiliate of the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. Uh, Rebecca's research extension and teaching focuses on the socioeconomic aspects of food systems and food supply chains. Uh, she leads multiple food and farming supply chain projects, teaches the food system foundation foundational and capstone courses for the new agroecology major at NC State and is the director of the Foundation for Food and Agricultural University Industry Graduate Student Fellowship. Uh, Rebecca has also been an integral part of the FoodLink team. So take it away on metrics and evaluation, Rebecca. Okay, thanks, Ellie. Hi, everyone. Um, I just have five minutes, so I'm going to spend, um, we want to get right to the, the value chain coordinators themselves. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about evaluation uh, before we hear about the actual value chain work from Brenda at Communities Unlimited in Memphis and then Sue at the Texas Center for Local Food. And I titled this Planning for Evaluation because it is at the planning stage that you really need to be carefully considering not only what your goals, objectives, and your actions are going to be for building a food value chain, uh, but also you need to be thinking carefully about what you will need to do, what actions you will need to take to be able to collect the data you need. So planning for evaluation does not mean that you just list out things you hope to collect, measures that you're going to stick in your logic model. Rather, it is specifying, rather it is specifying um, what actions you will be taking. Let me get on the right slide there. What actions you will be taking um, so that you have access to data, given that it's unlikely you'll be able to collect all of the data, particularly the sales data yourself. And info in these five minutes should mesh well with Brendan and Sue's introduction to their work and how they started because they'll speak a lot about building and leveraging partnerships. The goals of value chain work are largely the same as in other types of initiatives to build local and regional food systems. You seek to increase producer income, reduce farmland loss, et cetera. And so the measures that are used to evaluate the success of a value chain initiative are not really unique to building value chains. If your goal is to increase farmer income or reduce farmland loss, then that is what your evaluation measure is going to be based upon. And that dictates the type of data you must collect. You're going to have what's called process metrics, measures that describe your activities. For example, we successfully executed a grower buyer networking event with 20 growers and 20 buyers. Or we held six gap food safety workshops with 135 attendees. Those numbers are your process metrics because they describe your activities, your process of reaching ultimate goals. And then you'll have outcome measures. How many growers established a relationship with a buyer? How much product did they sell to that buyer? And by what percentage did that buyer relationship impact farm income? 
So these process and outcome metrics are very similar across the various types of projects focused on building food systems. What's really unique about value chain work is the value chain approach itself. It's focused on leveraging partnerships, specifically collaborative work with private businesses and the like. And believe it or not, this can work to your advantage in data collection. So when we talk about evaluation, we're talking about data. Data on farmer income, data on farmland law, data on access to fresh produce, whatever it is. Given unlimited time and limited funds and complete expertise in gathering data, you could conceivably gather all the evaluative data you need. But typically, a value chain coordinator within an organization is going to be short on time, short on funds, and through the value chain core, and the value chain coordinator or somebody else might have some expertise, maybe a lot, you still face that constraint on time and funds. And if you're doing your work through an outside funder or really told for any type of funding, you'll be hesitant to spend a great deal of time doing data gathering when there's so much more potentially impactful work to be done. What you likely have more of, and if you don't have it, you need to build it, is goodwill. Goodwill refers to friendly, helpful, cooperative feelings among the partners you work with. Now, likely you have this with other organizations that are similar to yourself. If you're a nonprofit, you have friendly relationships with other nonprofits, for example. But in the work of value chain building, you need goodwill with private businesses. This is typically whomever is downstream in the value chain. So from farmers and food producers downstream in the chain to food distributors, grocery retailer, retailers, food service buyers like restaurants, food service management companies at universities and hospitals. So you're very likely already thinking of these businesses as the sales channel, the end of the chain in your value chain. So I encourage you to think of them also as the sources of data, particularly that valuable data on purchasing, how much is purchased from whom. In value chain work, we often talk about bringing everyone to the table, the farmer, the distributors, the food service managers, we bring them all together in the same room, and everyone decides to work together. If only it were that easy. The work of the value chain coordinator is to build up goodwill with those in the value chain that are hardest to reach. And usually those people are those downstream private distributors and buyer entities. Brenda and Sue are both going to talk in a minute about the importance of building relationships and goodwill with business partners. So in conclusion, think of the access to outcome data, like sales to retail buyers. Think of that access as an outcome itself and something that you have to work on from the get-go. Think about what actions you'll be taking so that you have access to that data. Building goodwill among business partners is key, earning their trust, having them understand that you understand the constraints they are under as private businesses in a highly competitive marketplace. Define smaller pilot projects that are relatively easy for them, where you both test out a market relationship, and you also can illustrate to the business that you need to see the data to know whether or not what you're doing is actually benefiting everyone, including that business, the buyer at the end of the chain. When hearing from Brennan and Sue, think about how they have established business partnerships and what they have offered those businesses and others in the value chain including farmers and support entities such as nonprofits. Brenda and Sue have established a reputation of being the holders of valuable information and an extensive network of contacts, and that is at the core of being a value chain coordinator. And on to Brenda. Thanks, Ellie. Excellent. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, next up, we're going to be hearing from Brenda Williams, who is the Healthy Foods Coordinator for Communities Unlimited, uh, and she's based outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, in this role, Brenda is responsible for managing the healthy foods and value chain initiatives at Communities Unlimited. Prior to joining Communities Unlimited, Brenda served as a manager for the Fogelman College of Business at the Univers University of Memphis. Uh, her previous work experience includes program administration, being a grant writer, a major gifts officer, and a consultant for various nonprofit organizations. She received an MBA from Webster University and a BS in Business from Arkansas State. Brenda, take it away. Hello everyone, um, as Ellie has stated, I am Brenda Williams and I am with Communities Unlimited here in our Memphis office. And first of all, I just wanted to let you know, or let all of you know exactly uh, what Communities Unlimited is about. 
At the heart of our work is the vision that everyone has the opportunity to live and work in their hometown. We work hand in hand with community members to support their efforts to move from surviving to thriving by focusing on three main areas that includes community sustainability. We partner with rural communities to create vibrant, sustainable e economies by leveraging the local assets for long-term growth. The entrepreneurship side, we work with small businesses to help them grow, sustain, and to create jobs. And the environmental initiative of the organization is working with small rural communities. Most of the communities that we're working with are with populations less than 10,000. And we work with them to construct, operate, and maintain clean and safe water, along with sanitary wastewater treatment facilities. And we serve seven southern states uh, that includes Alabama, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, Tennessee, and Texas. So basically what I wanted to do is just, sorry, let me get the slide right. Bear with me uh, with the slide. Okay. So basically, I was just wanted to show you guys how uh, our value chain looks. Uh, right now, what you see is the uh, Mid South Food Link value chain, and it's the representative of Communities Unlimited and our partners, our partners from the producers to the consumers to the processors to also the funders and the economic developers. To show you an example of, this is the Mid-South Food Link. This is our value chain, and this is a map of it. And each map of the value chain will probably look different. But I'm showing you this so you can understand the context in which the system operates, and also so you can understand the different business links um, that function together as a system in order for the value chain to be successful. So with our value chain work, we want growers to have greater farm revenue, to have more cash flow, and to have financial stability excuse me, for their small-scale farms in the Mid-South Delta region. And basically, our model is based on the demand-driven model, the wealth works model, and that's what's been very successful with us in our value chain work. We start with market demand. Uh, we started initially working with a hospital here in Memphis, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital that was really interested in buying from local growers. And it was about connecting community assets to real market demand. So our objectives are to really link the local small-scale growers here in the Mid-South Delta region, we want to expand the producer to consumer network, and we want to increase the small-scale farmer production. We are here in Memphis, but we work with what we call the Mid-South Delta region in Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. It's about 150 miles outside of Memphis. So our goal is to increase the access of local fresh foods here in the area and to also to address the food desert. Currently, we are working with about 50 growers. Most of our growers are small scale growers um, that are working on family farms that have been in their families for a very long time. Um, they could be third or fifth generation farmers. Um, most of our growers are older growers. Uh, I would say probably the average age is maybe about 65. And so we provide them, what we've been doing with our value chain work is providing them with on-farm technical assistance uh, in order to help them become GAP certified. We've been having workshops for them on crop budgets and also trainings on produce food safety. So in reference to being the value chain coordinator, Communities Unlimited came into the food space as a new partner 
or as a new organization. We had been in these communities for a very long time, for more than 40 years, but we were very new in the food space. So the main thing for us to do was to immediately identify a key champion, and we did that with the strike force coordinator, Mr. Charlie Williams. And so Mr. Williams was extremely valuable in helping us get into the door, helping us to be able to recruit the more than 50 growers that we are connected with. And just to be able to let us know some of the challenges or some of the gaps that we had in our value chain. Um, a lot of our growers here are small scale, as I stated that, and I really want to put an emphasis on that because it's extremely important to know that you're dealing with small scale growers because if they do get a market with a um, wholesale distributor as Fresh Corn and one of our growers has a market uh, with him, they may not have transportation. And so that's a gap in the system and that's something you have to address. Or if you're connecting a grower to um, the school system here, they, not, they may not have transportation. And especially if it's a large school system, they may not be able to transport to um, 160 schools. So it, it really, when, you, when you're working with small growers, you really have to look at the entire value chain and find out what the gaps are and how you can address those. And I think the other thing was what has been extremely helpful is securing the anchor demand customer. Originally, we had St. Jude. We were working with St. Jude, and we had identified some crops that St. Jude was willing to buy from local growers. But in the midst of our value chain work, um, St. Jude uh, informed us that all the growers had to be GAP certified. And so for us, that was a big challenge because most of the growers here in the Mid-South Delta region, they are not GAP certified. Um, so with value chain work, you have to be flexible. And so what we did, we were able to get funding from one of our local funders, and we were able to hire a person on board to provide the on-farm technical assistance for growers to become GAP certified because it was really new. Uh, in reference to the growers that we're working with, to for them to learn exactly what is GAP certification. And so we're really fortunate that at this time, we have two growers that are GAP certified. And on Friday, I got a le uh, an email from um, one of our markets. It was actually Fresh Point, and he was saying that he had received the produce from the grower, and he was really pleased with it. And the grower actually got an opportunity to meet with the buyer. And for us, that is such a big win. It's a big win that I got a phone call or an email uh, from Fresh Point and we've been able to establish the relationship. So again, you have to be flexible when you start with one anchor demand customer and you might have to change and to find another demand customer. One of our major success stories I wanted to talk to you about is to farm the school. We had been working, um, We, I am in Memphis, and so we're on the border, as I stated, Arkansas and Mississippi. So we have been working with the Shelby County school system uh, for more than a year in order to just get them involved in, or engaged with uh, farm to school. And so we were able to connect with them by way of another partner. And partners and building relationships are so important in the value chain work, extremely important. Um, a lot when I was when I first started as a value chain coordinator, I was new to the food space, but I was fortunate that I would meet with different people, basically anyone who would meet with me or anyone who would talk with me, and I was able to meet with them. And during these meetings, they would share or give me reference or referrals to other people. And that was extremely helpful. Or they would also do an email connection, and that was extremely valuable as well. So we were able to connect with the Shelby County Schools, and we did a test project or a pilot project this summer. And we were so happy that we were able to connect them with about five growers, uh, and again, the small scale growers. And the growers were happy as well for a grower to get an order of $1,200. That's a win for him. It's a win for him when a grower states the price and the school system says yes, 
that's that's definitely a win. We were really concerned about the price point, if the school was going to accept it. But we were able to do a small pilot project. We were also able to bring, it was five different schools, and we were able to bring fresh produce into these schools. And we were really excited. And the school system or the lunch staff, they were extremely happy, happy to have fresh peaches and blackberries. And this was fresh produce that was probably picked maybe 48 hours prior to arriving at the school. And so those are some of the things that we found that has been extremely helpful. And we celebrate the small successes uh, because it's mean, it means so much to us. And our goal is to continue working with the Shelby County Schools to introduce the students to fresh and local produce. Um, and that's what has been extremely valuable to us. It's just a, I think the most imp thing, important thing would be the relationship building. And also, I would say you would just you would definitely have have to have the compassion for what you're doing because there may be some days when you called a buyer or a wholesale distributor ten times and you don't get a return call, but maybe it's that eleventh call when he's returning your call and you realize that that's a win for you. So at this point, I will pass it back over to Ellie. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, it's great to hear the challenges and successes. I know getting those GAP certifications was a pretty big win for you all um, and opened up a lot of doors. So next up, we are going to hand the mic over to Sue Beckwith, who's the Executive Director of the Texas Center for Local Food. Uh, TCLF collaborates with organizations across Texas and the U.S. to develop local food enterprises that support Texas sustainable agriculture and rural job creation. Sue's the former farmer, past president of Texas Organic Farmers and Gardeners Association and was the startup project manager for Coyote Creek Organic Feed Mill, the only certified organic commercial feed mill in Texas. She lives in Elgin, Texas, which is just outside of Austin, and that's where TCLF is located. Take it away, Sue. Hello. I hope everyone can hear me all right, and thank you so much for inviting me to present today. Uh, Sound great. I'm going to talk about just, okay, good. I'm going to talk about just four quick points that uh, that I hope will shed some light on 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 value chain food value chain coordination work and how we approach it, and hopefully uh, many of you will find it find it useful in your own work as you consider uh, jumping into this arena. The first point is really about a looking at doing a self assessment and looking at the alignment of your own organizational capacity. Uh, we're a new organization. We started just in 2016. As Ellie said, I had been doing uh, farming and had worked at the feed mill. And I just, I grew up a city girl. I started in farming in 2016. And our mission at the Texas Center for Local Food is really about focusing on the economic development piece. We believe that if we can help set up a system where farmers are earning a decent living farming, that a whole bunch of the other pieces of the food system will also be improved. We'll preserve farmland, people will have better access to local healthy food. So, you know, that's just sort of, that's kind of our mission and how we kind of came into this. Uh, we approach our work from a very pragmatic point of view. So we work on specific projects that in essence move food from rural to urban and money from urban to rural. So as I said, when we started out, you know, I, I came in pretty much already trusted by farmers and that's a really important first piece. Uh, I would say what I would recommend is thinking about what are the existing initiatives in your region, in your area, and where can your expertise leverage the existing capacity that's there for you? Where will you be needed? Where will you be appreciated? When we came into this, I am not, I don't have strong fundraising skills. I don't have, I have experience in grant writing because I have experience as a project manager. But I don't, I don't have a lot of experience talking with foundations. As I said, I work very, we work very pragmatically. So sometimes telling that story from a, from a higher level, from a bigger picture is real challenging for us. So we also didn't have a good understanding of the mainstream supply chain when we came into this work. 
And so what, what our challenge was then is to find partners and collaborators who do have the skills that we lack. So, uh, whoops, now I've hit too many buttons. Let me just go back one more time. Just to give you a little bit of context, uh, I work and live, we work and live out of Elgin, Texas. And we are in the center of Texas there. We're just outside Austin, a community that was rural and is quickly becoming suburban, about 10,000 people. Most of, 70% of the workers in our community commute all the way to Austin to work. We're a, a modest income community at best. Our median household income is 42,000 compared to about 78 in Austin. So a whole bunch of people in Elgin, most workers commute to Austin for an average of $12.30 an hour. They spend two hours a day in their cars. So that's just to give you a little bit of context of kind of where we are and what, what our community is like. We certainly work statewide, but we also focus very locally in Elgin with the hope of replicating some of the models we're developing to other areas, rural and, and suburban, around other Texas cities and hopefully other cities in the country. Others have, you know, every, everyone has talked about collaboration and partnership being really key, and it is. And humility is important coming in. You know, I would recommend that whoever you are and wherever your place is in food system work right now to to really understand that that this is this takes all of us working together it's a very broad it's a very broad piece of work and it's as rebecca said it's critical to include the private sector we work closely with austin food shed investors coyote creek organic feed mill and we're increasingly beginning to work with more closely with some of our private distributors uh, we don't have the capacity to do it all of our, all ourselves. And so when you're first starting out, if you think that value chain coordination is a really cool idea and it's, it'll be really great in a way to really get some practical progress made, it is important to just be humble and to, um, to not kind of come in as, well, we're going we're gonna to be the ones who kind of take over this now, that we all have to work together as equal partners. Uh, Finding local champions, Brenda talked about local champions uh, with influence is essential. I've been a project manager for over 30 years and all of the successful projects I've worked on have had those champions. So in Elgin, we have the uh, econ local economic development corporation. We have a couple of real key champions on that board. Austin Foodshed Investors is a huge champion and they reach out across our region in the Austin area. Our superintendent of public schools, she has the authority to say to the pro procurement director, we want, to, we want to buy more local food, figure out how to make that happen. And in fact, that's exactly what she's done in the Elgin School District. So yeah, working to vested interest. Oh, thank you, whoever changed my slide for me. Whoops, okay, good. This, this is a give get worksheet that I use that I thought I would share with y'all if it can be useful. <clears throat> I don't usually use it as a facilitated group discussion, but I usually kind of knock it out privately as I'm thinking about the various partnerships because there can be loose collaborations and there can be tight collaborations. And it's important that everybody be giving and getting in some kind of balanced way. If you have another organization or individual, for example, that really just wants to get a lot but isn't offering up a lot of their own resources, that may affect how many resources you put into that partnership with them. So it's just something to think about to make sure that everyone is giving and getting because that's, the, that's what's going to make the partnership and the collaboration really work. Uh, we work very actively with the City of Austin Office of Sustainability on the Good Food Purchasing Program, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. So knowing your data helps to focus your efforts. I mean, I'm sure everybody sort of knows that intuitively, but it's pretty hard to do. And we just finished up a price study of locally grown vegetables with the support of the St. David's Foundation. This came about because the farmers were really, frankly, sick of going to meetings about farm to school and talking about how exciting it was. And, and they would go to these meetings and everybody would be really excited. And then a month or two later, 
we finally start to talk about price and the bottom just falls out. That the price that schools are willing and able to pay isn't even close to the break even that farmers need. So we decided to look very specifically at 10 locally grown vegetables. And you can find the results of our study on our website. It's pretty easy to find. Uh, do the prices really work for farmers? And what we found is that, first of all, a lot of the vegetables need to be lightly processed, washed and cut up, and possibly frozen for the schools to buy them. And also broccoli look pretty good for farmers in Central Texas. We have mild winters and we can grow it pretty much throughout the winter. But potatoes, tomatoes, not happening. The, the price isn't even close. So we decided to then look at, we'll look at broccoli, maybe we'll look at carrots and a couple of other things for institutional sales. The city of Austin initiated the Good Food Purchasing Program with three major buyers in the Austin area about two years ago. That's the University of Texas, the Austin Independent School District and the Convention Center. Combined, they have a $25 million annual food budget. And through the Good Food Purchasing Program metrics, which talk about clean food, which talk about localness of the food that's purchased, which address metrics for worker health and dignity, humane treatment of animals. The Good Food Purchasing Program includes self-evaluation for each of these agencies, which they've done. And then over the, year, over the past year, they are beginning now to look hard at where can they actually make a purchase? Where can they actually buy something? How do they use their various funding sources to actually begin to make purchases? And the Austin School District is pretty much out in front uh, with the others following closely behind on beginning to put pressure, demand pressure on their distributors to buy from Texas farmers. The Capital Area Council of Governments is a huge resource for us and I would just encourage all of you to call on that resource for regional economic data, trend data, see if you can get food and food security related initiatives into those long-term plans that the Council of Governments typically produce. Our big win in Elgin, uh, I talked about the, the people who live and work in Elgin. Remember that $12.30, people are driving all the way to Austin to get that. They're spending two hours a day in their cars if we can begin to provide local food processing and local food business related jobs in Elgin, maybe for that same $12.30, that's a win for those folks. That's money in their pocket. And so we've been working with the school district and with strong support from the Elgin Economic Development Corporation to build what will become the Elgin Local Food Center, which will be right downtown. It'll be a food processing center, business development center, and commercial kitchen. The Elgin Economic Development Corporation has pledged $800,000 toward construction of that. The project is a total of about two and a half million and we're fundraising now for the, for the balance to hopefully start construction in 2019. So lastly, I wanna talk about vested interest in working with various organizations. We started working on the Elgin Local Food Center project with support from USDA back in 2014. The local folks didn't necessarily understand how, a lo how local food economy could really create jobs. I think people thought agriculture is kind of something of the past and what we really need is the big box stores on the highway and that, that will create the job. And the stores on the highway do generate quite a bit of tax revenue and they are important. At the same time, what can we do to meet with local agriculture to meet the vested interest of the Economic Development Corporation, the Chamber of Commerce, the school district. So the economic development folks, the bankers and so forth, care about quality local jobs. The foundations in our area, almost all of them wanna see healthy food access out into our communities. And the largest ones by their own admission don't care where that food comes from. They wanna see healthy vegetables in schools regardless of where that those vegetables come from. That's just a true thing. That's their vested interest. So how do we create or catalyze a food value chain that meets their vested interest and also meets all of the other values 
that we have when we talk about values, when we talk about clean food, when we talk about worker dignity, when we talk about humane treatment of animals. And so what we believe and what we've been working toward is this creation of local jobs in agricultural enterprises. That's farms, that's food processing, that's food hubs, that's packing, that's labels, that's even bookkeeping, attorneys, and all of the ancillary uh, services and jobs that are required for what we'll call a local food economic cluster. By creating those jobs, then we can people will have more money to be able to purchase the food and we will achieve the healthy food access. We will achieve the vested interest of those who are looking for a resilient or sustainable food supply. And for those who are wanting strong community, which is churches, community development folks, downtown restaurants. So in that way, by creating jobs in our in local agricultural enterprise, we will support the shared vested interest. So I think that's just about everything that I wanted to cover. Um, you know, I want to point out that, that support from USDA was really essential for us in getting started. And whatever those of you participating can do to ensure that USDA and federal level support continues for local food agricultural marketing and local food agricultural enterprise is really key. Because a lot of the folks, you know, the local bankers, for example, as I said, you know, local food, what do you mean? How, there's not real jobs in that. But yet the demand in Austin and the areas around Texas near us is huge. And how do we meet that demand? So ha having the funding from USDA was really critical in letting us create pilot projects so that we could demonstrate what a local food economy means and what it can do for our small community. So thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Sue. Um, I'm going to hand the, the mic back to Rebecca for just a few minutes. Yeah, so I think, you know, so we can get to questions um, right away because I think there are some good questions for Brenda and Sue. I mean, I just, uh, you know, a couple of points is to, to reiterate is that um, things that you may have planned, for example, what Brenda said about selling to St. Jude, you know, their plan was they were going to sell to a hospital that was going to be the anchor customer. They already had them on board. They were going to share data. Everything was wonderful. Um, They're going to add one produce item at a time. It's going to be like the iterative pro pro uh, process with growers. Uh, but then they had to go back, you know, Brenda had to go back to the starting gate um, to get everyone got certified. That changed everything. So to keep the growers going, however, um, you know, what she, she did was it was start to work on a farmer's market program in the growers community so that she could then, they would have those uh, markets to rely upon, you know, to grow their capacity while at the same time they were getting GAP certified. So you have to be nimble um, and you may have to change things radically. It's, so it's just a really long-term process. And from what Sue said about the, you know, the, the Elgin, the processing center, this has been years in the making. So it's really a long-term thing. And, and she had said before, you know, like a few months ago, if it, if it didn't fly this time and if the, that funding, you know, that core funding had not been committed, she was just going to have to drop it, you know, and, and move on to something else. So I would, you know, just there are a lot of things you could pull out, but I, I think let's, given the limited time, maybe let Brennan to address some of the questions that I see coming in. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Those presentations were wonderful. There are some fantastic questions. Maybe, Rebecca, if I, if I, can start with you. Um, can you um, can you uh, give a sense of, about your thoughts about uh, value chains and the long term long term sustainability of the relationships within value chains? Yeah. Well, I guess when I when I think about creation of value chains, I you know I, I think about market development and. Uh, it's difficult to have to bring both both the desire to increase access um, to work largely with limited resource farmers, let's say for example, um, to to focus on both those things when you're trying to build value chains and you and you're trying to convince, let's say your your core market that you want to sell to is institutional food service. You know, it's that's what's really important to understand. You know, kind of the reality of the situation and probably other 
entities in your state community may have already worked on this. You know, Brenda and Sue, they both have experience, you know, trying to build those kind of markets, and it's just a really high bar. So I think it just, it, you know, that, that question that you've asked is, that's a difficult one to answer without knowing a little bit more about what the, the um, asker is asking, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I mean, it, it's certainly as you, from, from what we've seen with some of the value chain coordinators is that, you know, the more, the longer they are in the scene, you know, the longer they are in that, the same position, they gain more and more knowledge, they gain more and more network connections, and uh, they become more and more valuable. So you can keep the value chain coordination, you know, going and it becomes richer and richer with more, you know, more different types of business entities. It's um, benefiting more um, growers, producers, but, um, if that person leaves, sometimes that's gonna that's gonna change things for you. <laughs> so it's good to have someone who's gonna be embedded in the community for a while uh, to work on it, and then and then those relationships get formed. You know, after I would say you know five years, then you could feel comfortable that that it would continue without support. And maybe that's what the questioner is asking: mm -hmm. is will those things continue without support? Mm -hmm. Yes, they will continue without support. If you if they're going to work in the first place, so if everything is you know kind of grant funded subsidized in the first place, it's unlikely that it would continue to work. It has to it has to pencil out. If the value chain coordinator's salary is subsidized, it, it has to be subsidized. Then the business connections that are made should pencil. That's sort of what what Zoo, Sue was talking about is that. You know, she could have tried all kinds of uh, produce supply chains for the school system, but she had to do the research to find out that broccoli and lightly processed were the ones that were going to work. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. I don't know if that answered it, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and coming up um, in our next webinar, there's an interesting example of a, a value chain that was um, – that was stimulated by uh, a value chain coordinator uh, and is now being carried on by members of the value chain itself. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it kind of depends. Sometimes it sticks, I think, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I, I would also say the, the fact that value chains um, tend to have shared values outside of the value of the dollar um, uh, will push them to um, be a little bit more robust than just those that just those relationships that are built just on the dollar. Um, and 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 the the sort of built-in transparency that is part of a, a functioning value chain also keeps people together. Would you would you all agree with that? Right, <laughs> going up. Um, okay. Well, yeah. Jeff, this yeah. is Sue. I mean, I agree with it, but I also think that that the one or two people who are at the core of the value chain work really has to be funded for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To 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 get what Rebecca said, to have that consistency, to have that, if you will, institutional knowledge, there has to be that assurance of at least the most basic of funding to keep it going and to get it through the rough times without burning people out and having them just fry and be gone. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear that. That was, uh, yeah, keeping, keeping that thread, having a person that you can turn to uh, you, is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's get to some more questions. Uh, Brenda, a specific question. Um, you were, uh, as you were doing you know, GAP certification, which certification were your growers asked to achieve? Was it USDA? So, yes, it's the USDA GAP that they were uh, required to achieve. Okay. Okay. Um, how can we involve private enterprises such as food manufacturers in a value chain? Um, and do any of you know any case studies where uh, private companies were involved in uh, creating or being a, a piece of a value chain? Well, 
Well, I could, this is Sue. I could talk briefly about Coyote Creek Organic Feed Mill, sure. uh, if you'd like. Um, Jeremiah Cunningham's vision for Coyote Creek Organic Feed Mill was that it, it in 2007 and 2008, is that it fill a gap in infrastructure and relational development in the local food value chain for organic laying hens, for organically raised, pasture raised eggs in our region. You couldn't get locally grown organic pasture raised eggs in central Texas, and in fact, not in the whole whole food Southwest region of the United States. And Jeremiah and his investors hired me to run the, to get the business off the ground. And through that, probably 100, maybe 150 farms now, 10 years later, are raising organic laying hens, creating, egg, making eggs for people every day in the region. And, and Coyote Creek, world's best eggs company, now has 20,000 laying, organic laying hens on pasture. So all of the all of that economic activity, just looking at organic eggs, pasture raised eggs, is now in place. That value chain is complete and working very well. Awesome. All right. Yeah, it's, it's a great example. And uh, I have to say again, uh, in an upcoming webinar, we will have a, a private company for for profit company uh, who has a value, value chain coordinator, they will be presenting, uh, and uh, it's, a, it's an important role f for the success of their company. I hope I'm teasing you effectively to come to all of these webinars, because I think they're going to be great. Um, okay, uh, Terry asks, what kind of trainings, uh, uh, training, and I'm going to add, or uh, and skills, is it beneficial for a value chain coordinator to have so, uh, in, Sue, for instance, talked about uh, the the trait of uh, humility. Um, why don't we Why don't we go around? Um, maybe Rebecca and Brenda and Sue in that order. Um, think about uh, a, a training, uh, either formal or or life training, uh, or um, some sort of uh, skill or attitude that you think uh, is very beneficial for. A, someone in the in the value chain coordinator role okay so so this Rebecca so um, definitely you need to know about procurement so how if, if that's if the goal is and it seems like many many times it is the goal that that you're trying to sell to a wholesale market um, to scale up the wholesale market so retail grocery stores you know food service distributors so you need to know about what their procurement rules are and be sympathetic to their constraints. So a lot of time, you know, at the individual grocery store level or the individual dining account at a university, they don't very, typically they have very little say so about procurement. So it's, you know, make sure you know that before you go in. Um, so that would be a big one. You could go to, um, you know, I think there are uh, webinars on the Wallace Center site about procurement. Um, it's very important to be knowledgeable about that. To have some kind of business background is going to be really important. Good. Great. Brenda, do you want to um, kick in? Yep. Yes. Um, so this is Brenda. So I would say um, not more of an educational background, but for someone to have a skill set of relationship building, um, uh, as you all know, that is just essential. Uh, for a value chain coordination, especially in the food space. And I just don't know, I don't think we would be able to do anything without that. So you would definitely need to know how to build relationships uh, and be able to sustain those relationships. Uh, and always realize that there, um, there's, we always say that there is always another seat at the table for the value chain work. So pretty much every time I go to a meeting, it's always a possibility of meeting someone new. Um, um, I have an example of that. Today I went to a meeting with one of my partners, and um, her husband uh, is actually the food and beverage director for uh, uh, one of the local uh, corp uh, corporations here. I'm thinking, wow, that's a win, and uh, because he is interested in buying from local growers. And so, again, it goes back to building relationships, always 
believing that there is always another seat at the table. So I would say that skill set. Thank you. And Sue, you want to put your top uh, skill or training? Yeah, sure. I mean, I completely agree with everything Brenda and Rebecca said. It's super important. Uh, the other thing I would say is go work on a farm. You know, really get out there and understand. Get dirty, get frustrated, get overheated. Well, not too overheated. <laughs> but it, whether, it's, whether it's a volunteer that, thing that you do uh, once a month or whether it's something you do for a whole week, uh, that's how you take your vacation time is I'm going to go work on this farm. Uh, join, you know, buy, buy all locally grown food for a week, all of your food for your family. See if you can do that. You know, get in and feel it. Uh, and that will give you the, com the, the kind of the muscle memory, if, if, if you will, and the compassion to understand uh, what it takes to, to grow food for us. Nice. Spoken as a true farmer. All right. Uh, I'm just going to try to serve up one last question. There are a ton of other great questions uh, with, that we are not going to be able to get to because of time. But um, uh, the question is, is value chain coordination always done by a single individual functioning in this role? Or can it be an organization or uh, that, that functions as that coordinating body? Can I, this is Rebecca, let me just, I'll say one thing and then we can quickly go around. So from what I've seen, you know, working with Foodlink and, um, you know, those 13 organizations that had, you know, a value chain coordinator within them, and some, and in some cases that was a split role, and I think it's better for a single person, or if you're going to have more than one person, two people that know everything that the other person knows because you just become the hub of information you become the hub of information and it's not just you know data 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 points or knowledge about institutional markets but but it becomes where you're you're kind of a a broker of information and your people trust you so they you know the a buying entity trusts you to tell them about you know where they can find x y and z a farmer trusts you to set them up or you know do an intro to a to a buyer that you've had a relationship with so I, that's what I would say is it's best to have one okay yeah I, I um, uh, if um, you know we, we, we talked about uh, or Jim talked about the multiple roles and um, I can see that um, in within an organization uh, you could have Different functions served by uh, by different roles, um, so but but it seems seems to me like there uh, you um, as you say if you are uh, there's a lot of good internal communication you you can have an inst uh, an organization that that takes on the role. Yeah, yeah, I agree. All right, um, Let, Jeff, this is yeah, Sue. Yeah, go. Could, could I just say one thing about? I mean, I I agree with Rebecca. I think. We don't want to confuse a distributor, right, who's thinking about adding local food to their uh, product offering. So we want to give them a single point of contact that, that helps their business not be inefficient. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's in, important that, as Brenda said, that the personality of the person doing the, the value chain coordination is open and freely networking because the actual work on the ground and the contacts comes from dozens and dozens of people in the area. So it's, it's kind of both, but having a single point of contact, the, the conductor person may, you know, a coordinator, not a boss of everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, y'all. How's my audio sound, Jeff? Is it better? Yeah. Oh, all right. Um, well, sorry about my little technical glitch back there, guys. Um, thanks, Jeff, for stepping up. Uh, and especially thank you to our presenters, uh, particularly Brenda and Sue, for letting us all look under the hood of their hard work. Um, I learned a lot, and I talk to you guys a lot anyway. So thank you for uh, sharing and for your time, and I hope everyone is going to be able to learn and adopt and adapt uh, in response to what they heard today.
So this webinar is being recorded and we post our archived webinars at ngfn.org slash webinars. We have 80 at least webinars organized by topics. You can learn from experts across the country on topics that interest you. Uh, and we have a wide range of topics there. So please check those out. Um, we also have a lot of exciting opportunities coming up in the next couple weeks and months that you should all take advantage of as well. Um, the next one is actually next week. Thursday at 3.30, and it's going to be on the Food Hub benchmarking study that Wallace Center conducted with our friends at Farm Credit, uh, and it's going to give you all a really good sense of where the Food Hub sector is today and how we can make it better in the future. So check that out, again, ngfn.org slash webinars. Um, we're also going to be continuing the VCC webinar series with the next one coming up on August 30th, and that's going to be about convening how to host a, a large group event and figure out exactly what you got out of that with some uh, evaluation tools. Then we'll move on to market matchmaking in September and then policy uh, in October. So please stay tuned and you can register for those now as well at that same ngfn.org slash webinars uh, URL. Um, we also have lots of communities of practice that you can join online, including one focused on food hubs, a brand new one that just started a few weeks ago focused on value added processing and also the Wallace Center's Food System Leadership Network that's focused on building capacity in community-based food organizations. Um, the Food System Leadership Network is a community of practice uh, that, yeah, focused on community-based organizations that are working on food systems change, uh, and it's focused on building up leadership, strengthening operational management and capacity, uh, and then also just supporting and celebrating and connecting and learning from other people that might be far away but are doing similar work. Um, so check that out, uh, wallacecenter.org slash FSLN. One thing that I did, did want to note is that the FSLN um, is offering one-on-one -on -one mentorship services with some of the best and brightest food system leaders from across the country, you can apply to get uh, direct coaching and guidance from some real superstar food system leaders. So check out that FSLN uh, website again to, to apply to take advantage of that service. It's free and you get some really incredible one-on-one uh, -on -one time with some really special people. So check that out. Um, we also are going to have a series of webinars from our Pastor Project Initiative that focuses on regenerative agriculture. Uh, those are uh, some really hard-hitting sustainable ag uh, uh, trainings on how to integrate grazing and cover cropping into uh, your farm operation. So check those out as well. And then lastly, uh, if you have any questions for us or webinar ideas or want to get in touch, you can reach us at contact at ngfn.org. Uh, and again, um, please check out ngfn.org in general because there's all of these incredible resources for you to take advantage of. And lastly, please do take our webinar survey. Uh, you'll get an email with that shortly. And we really appreciate it. It helps us keep getting better and better. And that I think is it for this webinar. I know we ran a little bit long, so thank you for those of you who stuck around. And again, feel free to reach out and take advantage of all of our webinar archives. And we hope to see you on the rest of this VCC webinar series. And with that, we are concluding the webinar. Thank you all.